Ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome to our 30th Rimini meeting. Yet another great opportunity to be together Another great uh, experience, as, as you know, the title is that knowledge is always an event. And this morning, oh, there will be a good opportunity to learn, to deepen our knowledge, to learn something new. I have here Marcos, Professor Folloni, and Alessandre, <laughs> who is here to help with the translation from Portuguese. Now, as you have just seen on the slide, development stems from, from the eye, from the id. So development has a face, a face which is closely related to the heart, the heart, and, uh, and our desire to grow, to develop, and our desire for beauty, for improvement. Minister Frattini, yesterday met with five African leaders and they all said something new and unprecedented about Africa. The, I, the, the, the fact that the Africans can be at the center of their own development in an international partnership and Minister Frattini underlined the importance uh, of the African people as beneficiaries of our aid and not the importance of bureaucracy. And we have here the Director General for Cooperation. Obviously, we are going through a recession. And I think a great effort is undertaken in terms of cooperations in order to listen to the advice given by, by Mr. Frattini. Person again at the center of our cooperation efforts instead of bureaucracy. So please, Dr. Belloni, you have the floor. Good morning. So, first of all, I have to welcome you all here and extend the greetings of the uh, foreign ministry, especially the minister himself, Mr. Frattini. He was with us yesterday and greatly contributed to the debate, con debate concerning uh, conflicts in Africa. And also, I would like to welcome you here on behalf of the Italian cooperation. Uh, I have the difficult task of uh, uh, leading this unit within the ministry. So thank you very much for having invited me. I also think that talking to you this morning in this important setting and in this very important Rimini meeting takes on a very peculiar and a very uh, deep meaning. Now, I took office exactly one year ago as a director general, and I can only confirm that I uh, accepted immediately the invitation for the Italian Corporation to be here. Now, why did I accept the invitation? And what does, what does this imply, accepting this invitation and talking here at the Rimini meeting? I asked myself, why? I asked, why am I so enthusiastic and why are all the other members of my staff to be uh, so happy to be here and participate in this exchange? Well, I can only tell you that I firmly believe, and I am here with a sense of responsibility, participating not only physically in this event, but also we have a small stand outside of our cooperation department. And yesterday, I... Uh, I read the words sent by Cardinal Bertone and which were then published on the Avenire. And Cardinal Bertone reminds us all of the importance of the persons and of knowledge in the process of knowing, of, of knowledge. And as the Cardinal puts it, we have to go beyond dogma and beyond objectivity. Now, what does this mean? Well, I, I've understood that the enthusiasm with which the Italian cooperation works 
and, and the enthusiasm that, that with which we are here is because we are fully aware that we, Italian institution working for cooperation, we are just one of the, of the subjects working uh, for the success of our projects. We are here to tell you that we have a lot to do and a lot to say, hopefully, that we want to work more and, as Cardinal Bertoni t reminded us yesterday, we are aware that knowledge, that the truth and our achievements is not something that we can do on our own all by ourselves because, as Cardinal Bertoni said yesterday, there is a prerequisite for this dogma of mere objectivity. And this is something that you can only achieve through the meeting, th an encounter between people. So I'm here to tell you that cooperation is an plays an important role, and I can only confirm that the state wants to take on its own responsibility of being a major actor in the field of cooperation, but also I want to be here as a listener as well. I want to contribute together with all the others in the search for truth and knowledge, something that we are in all interested in. Obviously now mm, times have changed and it would be a mistake in a moment like today when cooperation is undergoing changes, it would be a mistake to work without being deeply rooted in the present reality. You are all within this reality. And I think that these meetings, it, it's a great opportunity to listen to each other. Now, when I c came into this room together with the other members of the panel, I was moved by the way you welcomed us, especially the way you were clapping your hands for Cleosa and Marcos. It's been very, very re rewarding and certainly an opportunity to learn because then all together we will have to continue working concretely, uh, giving our contributions, and I hope that we'll really be able to achieve uh, more success. Obviously, development uh, has seen various phases, and I don't want necessarily to tell you what has been good and what has been bad. There have been very positive moments in time uh, with reference to uh, our development, and also difficult times. There have been also failures and mistakes, absolutely. But. Mm, the reality is now very different. Obviously, we moved on from a, a colonialist approach when we had the third world that probably, and there's been a lot of exploitation. Then there has been the post-war period, post-colonialist, where probably the states were the only subjects that, has, that had an interest in development, probably to exploit and also to have more and more power in a bipolar world where there was a very delicate balance. But after the collapse of the Berlin Wall, then who are at present the subjects that are more involved in cooperation? Now, last night I had dinner with Father Aldo, and he said maybe there are even, there are even too many people and subject, subjects involved in cooperation. Now, the challenge that we now have ahead of us is that of putting together all these contributions to take the best from everyone so that we can then define the reality which going beyond the dogma of the objectivity becomes the reality which allows us to work effectively thanks to this encounter between all the subjects that are interested in development. And, uh, I have to mention the civil society, the press, the multinationals, new emerging states, the beneficiaries of our aid, and also the single person, each and every one of you, the person who have an interest in this new world, those that are interested in all the problems connected with the developing world.
Sometimes it's difficult to find like the point of convergence, the, the ideal meeting point, so that all the subjects can have a say, can give their own contribution and create a system, a network, so that no resources are wasted, so that we can benefit from what everyone has to give. I mean, in the past we had the state as the central player. Now we are in a different world, we have different subjects, and sometimes it's difficult to find the ideal path for development. That's why for me it's even more important to listen to our guests today, and especially I'm here to learn from, fr from these encounters, from your warmth, from your welcome, and from this exchange of ideas. Now, our entire new approach has been based on, on this. We have attempted to involve in our strategies all the subjects that at present are within the development process. So, in the beginning, we attempted to involve the civil society. We invited them to give their contribution so that we would not be alone, so that we could listen to each other from the good that there can be in all those that are involved in development, seriously involved. Now, having said this, and uh, hoping that we can all learn from each other and that we can uh, continue work on development, I would like to conclude. Thank you very much. A year has gone by since uh, the uh, 24th of February 2008 when it was said that the uh, rain which uh, fell today represents 20 years of fighting for houses for the whole of our mu movement. That 24th of February, when I was uh, lucky enough to be in that place, uh, when Maltus and Cleusa put themselves in the hands of Caron, having gleaned in uh, the uh, meeting with Comunione Liberazione, having understood the significance of their struggle. From that time to today, a little more than a year has gone by, but it seems a lot longer in terms of intensity and in terms of a mutual experience from which we have both learned. And I'd like to thank uh, Elisabetta Bellone for this, for having declared uh, that she is here to listen and learn. And we are here to deepen this knowledge today, trying to understand in uh, the uh, presentation first of Cleusa and then of Marcos, and with Professor Giuseppe Foloni, known to his friends as Beppe, if you allow me. We are here to understand and learn that this sort of meeting, this human tray which uh, triggers the f spark uh, within man, this changes reality. And it has a social and civil dignity. And this is uh, what we want to look at today through the testimonies and then through Beppe's presentation. The floor to you. Good morning, friends. I have no words to thank your company, your association. I started working in the favelas, the poor districts, very early on. I was about 14 at the time. I was poor too, but I didn't live in a favela.
and I met with the women of the parish church and we looked at things together and we took what we had to the people of the favelas. And a desire started to form in my heart. That is, to take people away from there to another place, people who lived in these huts. Every day I prayed, oh Lord, show me the way. When in 1985, we saw the what we call the Campaign for Fraternity, which was born within the church, and the idea was uh, the land of God, the land of brothers. And throughout the city, popular movements sprung up which uh, struggled to give people houses. And that was when we started organizing people to build real neighborhoods. But these were neighborhoods which were very much in the outskirts of San Paolo. And we saw with our struggle that uh, these uh, neighborhoods did spring up thanks to our work. But the situation was very difficult because there was uh, no light, water, schools, transport, or uh, creches, nursery schools. So I was very unhappy because I saw that people, in fact, still lived amidst great difficulty. And therefore, a further struggle started. At each step, we said, well, today we don't have a school. Uh, that small group, sure, no longer lived in the favelas, in the poor area, but still was beset by difficulties. And every time we tried to explain why we were upset and sad, what the reason was, and then we were able to have a school, but then we saw that a hospital was missing, and then we got the hospital. But still then, we saw that transport was missing, and now we don't have lighting. And gradually, we acquired all these things. But I looked and observed that neighborhood, and I saw there was something different. There were no longer huts, there were real houses. But there was still a lot of rubbish around the streets. Uh, couples that split up every day. Youngsters who were sent to prison. And I asked, uh, Lord, show me the way. And one day, I looked at them and I was struck by a particular sentiment. We have taken people away out of the favelas, but the favelas continues to live within them still. And now I said, Lord, show me the way. In three years, I saw four people commit suicide. Everything terrible that happened left me even sadder. And in 2001, I thought, well, it is not worth it anymore. I said, Lord, 
why did you make me take up this struggle? Because it's not worth it. And one day, by chance, by pure queer incidents, we met. And I wanted to move out of this association, move out of the movement. And I said to her, you have a great work. I'd like you to, uh, you do great work. I'd like you to meet my friends, he said, and invited me to uh, go to certain places, but I didn't want to go. I thought it would be just like the other things that, uh, that smack of the church. Says so I go to church, I go to mass. I mean, I come from a Catholic tradition. And in 2003, I put forward an invitation, or an invitation was given me to go to church for that person, for her. And so I went. I couldn't refuse. And that was the uh, first work of the Compagnia delle Opere. And uh, people spoke in a strange way. I didn't understand what they were saying. And I said to myself, well, Lord, why on earth did you bring me here? What have I come to do here? I don't understand anything. Quando I mean, when the Italians speak, it's very difficult for me to understand. But when Vita Dini speaks, it's even worse. And he t told us a story. And I was being the translator. And he said in Italy, there was a group of young people who did charity work. They uh, met a very poor woman on the streets, and uh, they gave her money that they had collected for her to buy food. They went to Don Giussani afterwards and said, you know, that woman, she uh, bought lipstick with the money. She bought perfumes. We don't want to help her anymore. And Don Giussani answered, but who are you to judge her, that woman? Perhaps today, this is the happiest day of her life because she's felt that she is a woman, finally. Now, for me, that story was the turning point. Because I thought back to those women who had left the Farveles, but the Farveles had not left them. And as soon as I got back, I started thinking along those lines. And I started looking at these women in a different way. We started within our community centers carrying out courses. Uh, hairdressing courses, music courses, uh, uh, gyms, and we started seeing that that started to change their lives. So they started inviting me to other um, activities of the movement, and I went along. I wanted to know everything about the movement. And I wanted to uh, be a part of that association.
those women had started to change, both from the aesthetic point of view, but also uh, in their participation. And they also started to uh, clear up the rubbish and uh, save things, save money. The whole neighborhood started to improve. The meetings that I went to of the movement, I always learned something, and I went back and put it into practice. The government makes many more houses and builds many more houses than we do. The government takes many, many people out of the favelas, out of the shanty towns. But the only thing that can really change a person is the consideration and uh, the way that you look at that particular person. You can't change a person if he or she is not embraced, is not taken in. I have been changed. I have been changed because I have been embraced and taken in, first of all by myself and embraced and taken in by every person belonging to the movement. People always ask me, but how come? How did this happen? Because I learned in s within the movement that Christ is not an idea. It's not a belief. Christ is a presence. And in my life, I have learned this. And I have learned this w within Comunione Liberazione. I have lived all my life within a church and its traditions, but being taken in, uh, being embraced by a movement taught me more. This look, this embrace I offer to my own associates. And today, a woman, in fact, asked me, well, how can you manage to work with 120,000 people? I can't do it. I'm sure that there are other people. There is someone else. And this is what you have taught me. I'd like to, I thank God every day And to, I thank also all the people from Comunione Liberazione that uh, I have met because you have changed my life. And it's here that I have uh, understood. It's here that I learned. And it is with this embrace, with this look, that I in turn return and give back to my 120,000 people because it is this look of tenderness and concern that fills me with strength. Each of every one of you is a presence of Christ for me. I like to thank you all, you who have brought the movement thus far so that I could meet you. A people has changed. I have changed because I have met you. I've met the look and the embrace of each and every one of you. Thank you.
Voi capirete con che stato d'animo io riprendo. Now, you certainly understand that it's not easy now for me to take the floor again. We are all, we've all become very emotional and it's been very touching what we've just heard. Now, yesterday I was talking to Cleusa and she was really very worried. She was really very anxious about the idea of talking in public, obviously great expectations. But as usually, you've been very, very good, as always. E introducendo Marcos. And now I would like to move on to Marcos, who is also a member of parliament in the state of San Paolo. And looking at them and looking at what they do, now this gap between knowing and believing or uh, knowing or getting to know is is, I mean, the two things come together in what they do, in their action. Uh, and it's what we've learned from Father Carron. It is something that takes place in reality, something that happens. It's not just theory. And uh, uh, what uh, Cleusa has just told us, together with what Marcos will soon be telling us, is a proof that things can indeed happen. Please. I would like to start by thanking each and every one of you because from here, from this table, looking at you, I realize that it doesn't matter which side of the ocean you are. We all belong to the same people. We are all we are all children of God, and we are all uh, close to Don Giussani. Now, I was thinking about what I should be telling you during this speech. And I looked back at my experience, at my life, because then, I mean, that's the only thing that I can tell you about my own life. And I remember that when I started working, when I was young, I started working in a favela called Villa Prudente in the city of San Paolo. And um, I started giving language classes to adults. And uh, as an ambitious young man, I was, I was just thinking that I would teach the people to read and write. But then already the second time that I went to them, I realized that there was much more that I could learn from them rather than teach them. I had in front of me people who didn't know how to write or read, but which had really had a, a huge experience in terms of what they had lived, what they had been through. So they had so many things to tell uh, that I was absolutely amazed. And then I realized that I was working because I had an ideal. And initially, I had wanted to become an engineer, but because of a legal problem of one of those families that had, that had to leave, abandon their home, I decided to study architecture. 
but nevertheless I continued thinking that I was doing that for an ideal. And now I know that now no, my encounter with CL expl clearly explained to me the reasons behind my life, behind my choices. Now the way I went through life didn't change because I had an ideal. It changed because I met uh, a lady called Maria Jose, whom every Saturday would uh, make a very simple meal for me at lunch. or Mr. Caetano, whom every Saturday and Sunday would help the people in the favela, helping them to build their houses or the community center. Or other men like um, Pedro, Gonzalo. And I gradually realized that what had really changed my life had not been an ideal, but rather a concrete encounter and the concrete faces of people. People that, and I didn't realize this in the beginning, people were extremely important in my life. At the time I didn't realize it, but they have, have been indeed very important for my life. And I could never have turned my back on, on them. Now, if you want to help people to develop and grow, then you have to be emotionally involved. You can help other people to be him or herself, and, but you, at the same time, you have to work on yourself. You have to and a few weeks ago, Father Aldo said something that struck me very much. He said, my greatest achievement is uh, building my own eye, my, my own id. So, my friends, you can, you can build uh, houses you, and you can build many things in the world, but unless you build yourself, uh, then it's all useless. And this is something that I have understood after this encounter. We had the privilege of being together with Caron for five days and looking at him, uh, I think it's really amazing because uh, year after year, uh, his freedom, his liberty increases and it's obvious that he works on himself and he becomes a better man year after year. We had the opportunity to go to Paraguay on the 20th of November of last year, and we met Father Aldo. Now, looking at Father Aldo and at what he does, uh, inevitably, if you look at it, inevitably you are moved, you are deeply touched. I've never met anybody else who is so fond of life and who is, who is so, such a giving person, somebody who works for the others. I've never met anybody else who is so deeply, 
who believes that you can build yourself and you can develop your own self, your own I. Father Aldo and Father Caron are uh, persons that you can learn a lot from. And all, and especially, and you can learn a lot from all our friends, from all the other people. And then there is a kind, of, you are jointly moved, you share things. But this is not the final point, there's more to it. We all have to strive to become free, free persons just like Caron. I want to look at Caron and learn to be a free man just like he is. I want to look at Father Aldo and I want to learn to love the same way that he does. I want to learn, just like he does, that I am you and you have an impact on me. You make me. And the only way that you can help people to grow and to develop is to really appreciate and, and experience all the nice things that you come across in life. Very often we think that we are being helpful, that we do charity, but in reality we are destroying people's lives. Because in Latin America, in Africa, and in other places of the world, we don't need we don't need, we don't need people who simply give money, give aid. We need people who are ready to share their own life. We need people like Father Aldo. And of course, what he does requires money. But much more than money, we need a heart. They need a human heart to testify to the beauty of Christ in our life. And I really hope that all the people that I, that I encounter, that they cannot understand this and that we have to to give ourselves. We have to give and give ourselves. And today I can tell you that now I fully understand that Christ once said, if you don't lose your own life, you, you, you won't meet anyone, you won't encounter anyone, because unless you give you give up your own life, then you cannot understand the true meaning of life. And only if you give everything that you have, then you can find happiness. It's the importance of giving, giving. And, and that's why I've understood that what makes me happy is not the pursuit of an ideal. And I want to thank you all very much. What really makes me happy is not pursuing an ideal, but rather uh, the relationship with people. Obviously, the, after the encounter. I don't know what my life would have been if I hadn't met C.L. But I can assure you that really this encounter has made me a happy man.
Il poeta Vinicius che gli the poet uh, Vinicius, whom our Brazilian friends know well, says uh, that uh, in uh, fact uh, that uh, life is the art of encounters, even if there are many clashes in life. In Cleos and Marco's words, we have heard this, how to li look differently at women, there is the embrace and uh, the way people uh, are looked at, which means that people start collecting their rubbish. I thought that I lived for an ideal, uh, he said, but I realized that there was a very concrete uh, thing about it and meeting, and uh, you change and do things only if uh, your heart is involved, only if you have an emotional involvement. Well, I hope that you appreciate that these words in what I call a humanitarian scientist's attitude, in other words, people who study from MIT downwards as to uh, what development should be, how many people should be allowed to live, how many should be allowed to die, what the indices are, and so on, these words that they repeat all the time do not contain this uh, emotional involvement. There's a theoretical man uh, that has been dreamed up in an aesthetic uh, university lab. And this man should dis develop uh, according to the lines of uh, those who have a full stomach. And that's how man has been designed and how uh, he should proceed. But we want to throw out a challenge to that and say that these words that are not uh, contained in the vocabulary of uh, human scientists, we want to change that And with these words. And therefore, I'd like to thank Beppe Folone and Gabriella Ilaria and Maria Teresa who, if, with their very special endeavor, are trying, together with the, the Foundation for Solidarity, to look critically and systematically at this whole situation, to be able to glean good examples. I don't like to say the word good practices, because practice, too, has something uh, which uh, is slightly abstract. Uh, and here we want to intimate the involvement of the heart. But in other words, they are trying to uh, get across the idea of how uh, treading the red uh, soil of uh, Africa, uh, we must also refer and have our heads uh, in Brussels, uh, Washington, and elsewhere to be able to uh, get, go beyond that uh, scientific uh, humanism. I'd like to apologize first and foremost because uh, I, my words will be less emotional and less charged than the words uh, of Cleusa and Marcos. I was very struck, and certainly uh, what is pivotal to what I'm going to say is in those words. If we, in fact, don't uh, wipe out the favelas in the hearts of men, nothing will have changed. What we have heard is quite exceptional. It's the understanding of a way of doing things in a different manner to what we are used to. In other words, a way that uh, is more real because it uh, hits at the heart of the needs of people. And in this way, it is, and these words are exceptional. And when you see this, you say, well, that's of course natural. It's how it should be. Now, therefore, let's ask ourselves the first question. Is it exceptional because uh, of the fact that Creusa and Marcus actually exist, because it happened there? Is it exceptional because it cannot be repeated, or can it happen again? This is the first question we have to ask ourselves. If it couldn't be repeated, well then, it would be a beautiful event, standing there unto itself. Now, this question of happening again and being repeatable 
is, uh, is something which, in fact, uh, uh, is con as concerned of uh, the international um, or organs like the World Bank, for example. Gabriella asked this of the World Bank, and the World Bank say, said that replicability is all important because uh, it's worth nothing if it's a one-off. Now, what does uh, repeatability or replicability for the World Bank mean? It means that what has happened in one place, in San Paolo, for example, can be written in a report, uh, bullet points can be made. A sort of uh, set of instructions can be made of this. The instruction book can be uh, disseminated and uh, uh, other people are told to do likewise. This is what repeatability or something which can be replicated is uh, meant by the World Bank. But for us, this means the moving of people, the id, the eye of people, and it's uh, their engagement which uh, is so human and which can be repeated. This is what we mean by repeatability. And this is the whole issue of uh, Christianity. Uh, Christ can be repeated here. He's present here today because if this isn't, were not the case, it would be an event of the past. It would make us feel somewhat nostalgic for what happened in the past. But uh, today, uh, here and now, uh, we see this uh, replicability which exists. So if it's not a method, if it's not an approach which can be, and a road that can be taken, it is of no use. And they themselves said this, Alberto said that before as well. What he does with his projects, in fact, if it were not uh, replicable in this way, would be worth nothing, would be of no use. Now, I try, I'm try. i trying to understand and answer uh, this whole issue uh, by taking you through a few logical steps. The first step, shows that if it doesn't happen without an experience similar to what we have heard, if this does not take place, well, then there is no development. And I'm saying something even more. I'm, not, I'm saying that not only is there a method or a road to pursue, but it is the method, not a road to pursue. It's not a, a road, but it's the road to development. This is the first step to set down that there are no other methods or roads. And the experience of the past 50 years, in fact, uh, have in fact proved only partially successful and therefore, at the end of the day, uh, non conclusive, inconclusive. Secondly, I'd like to underline the steps of the method which uh, in Cleos and Marcos's uh, testimonials uh, we have seen. And also, thanks to the uh, synthesis that uh, Alberto has given us, also is seen. Let me say one thing on the side before I go into another uh, step. Certainly, what we have heard is exceptional or this year and also last year. Elisabeth Berluni said this, and I agree with her. Uh, the applause that we heard and that we gave means that uh, we have understood that uh, there, there was something that really can trigger and bring about change within us and within the people around us. I had uh, the applause myself as well as Elisabetta and uh, the others too who talked. Now, the first step, the attempts, the hypotheses which have been put forward to lay the basis for development through something which does not involve the developing of a particular person and actor, all these roads have led nowhere. Today, faced with the crisis, people are proposing to increase aid, uh, quite rightly from a certain point of view, emergency aid, food aid, especially for the poorest countries here. Uh, these poor countries have an increasing number of people that don't have enough to eat because exports, in fact, are falling and uh, immigrant remittances have fallen and therefore the whole economic system has uh, 
fallen by the wayside. And this has immediate consequences, especially for uh, the poorer countries. So it's right to talk about uh, greater aid, emergency aid. But we have to ask ourselves whether over and above the necessary uh, r responding to emergency requirements, whether the aid, uh, aid as a system can really respond to development uh, requirements and needs. Uh, because if you don't uh, trigger real development, uh, and if by giving food aid you don't trigger that uh, development, well, we are not uh, answering the real issue and trying to move the real issue. And we don't, in fact, bring about that uh, spark that triggers uh, development, as Alberto said at the beginning, that doesn't start something off. The definition of uh, development uh, is that uh, certain groups of people set themselves in motion to change their uh, behavior via vis-a-vis -vis their situation and reality. This is, has been the definition of reality. Now, where does this happen? Where does it take place? Well, first of all, let's say that a simple transfer of resources like aid may well not be sufficient to trigger this spark. And as I say, over and above emergency aid, this indeed might uh, increase forms of perverse dependency, short-term measures to sustain an economy which is floundering. Uh, this can have permanent uh, negative results. And first and foremost, this is a cost which will have to be paid for tomorrow. But on the other hand, as was said, the habit of uh, receiving aid and forms of funding can be difficult to dismantle. One becomes uh, dependent upon the aid. Whereas if development really is uh, the triggering and the uh, getting moving of groups of people vis-a-vis -vis their own situation and uh, changing their attitude uh, to the situation, well, monetary aid uh, aid, as we have uh, seen it in the last 50 years, especially if systematically filtered through bureaucracy and uh, administrations, well, this sort of aid indeed can be uh, very, uh, can be valueless or even indeed unproductive. unproductive. There's another aspect that the crisis has brought to the fore, especially in the newspapers, and that is uh, the whole issue of the uh, institutions. And many among the institutions are thinking that uh, the basic rules that uh, governed the financial and uh, other markets uh, weren't sufficient and betrayed us, and that these must be changed. And we must have a system of uh, government with a supranational body similar to what we have for trade uh, rules, for example, in the WTO, the World Trade uh, Organization, that this sort of supranational organ uh, shall uh, dictate the, or set down the rules to make the system work. But here we have to ask, if you change the rules, I'm not saying that the this is not necessary, but is this the key? Is this the turning point if you change the rules and concentrating power into the hands of a supranational representative uh, body which brings together all country as which has, has been um, asked for by the Stiglitz uh, the Commission, uh, especially to solve the crisis in the poor countries, is this sufficient to guarantee development, we could ask? Is uh, this the answer? Is this the lesson that history has given us? The history that we, the long history that we have lived through, uh, how we have developed in uh, uh, our society, is this the lesson that has been handed down to us? In the sixth century of uh, our history, the beginning in the change of barbarian peoples who had invaded the former Roman uh, Empire uh, didn't uh, spring from a new strategy or a new body, but rather from 
an, the encounter with people who lived in a more humane way, the monks of the time and the people who lived around the monasteries, the villages that were sprung up among around the monasteries. These people lived in a different way. They lived in peace. They lived working and not being predators. The Byzantines thought that the only possible strategy vis-a-vis -vis the barbarians was simply to defeat them and send them back to their country of origin. The uh, Gregorius, uh, Gr Gregory, uh, St. Gregory the uh, Pope, uh, did not think in that way. He went out to meet these people and decided for a different strategy, that of encounter. And encounter was the word that we heard before. This is what happened in our uh, history. And it also, there's another uh, very uh, famous uh, history and a story, for example, uh, that of Jesus. Jesus uh, uh, came and found a lot of evil, uh, but he didn't go out uh, to uh, defeat it, uh, but he proposed something different to people he met, a different life. And uh, this is what changed the face of the world and over time solved many problems, uh, solved the problem of slavery. Uh, the, the work of the culture of work and so on came about, and this was a um, event in humanity. This is what was the turning point in our history, and this is part of what we have just heard. It's uh, the nucleus, it's the pivotal point of uh, development, what we call development. And if this does not happen, the favela will not be wiped out from the hearts of people. Now, let me grab briefly look at whether the other hypothesis, not the one uh, described, but uh, uh, the whole aspect of giving uh, aid in terms of uh, practical help, building walls, building things, whether that's sufficient. Uh, the Ivory Coast uh, became independent uh, in uh, 1969, and uh, Ram Nkrumah, the president, had great ideas and he wanted to change this from independence in 1957, sorry, it became Ghana. Ghana, for example, produces two-thirds of the cocoa of the world. It had good schools. The British were uh, fairly good from that point of view. They had given Ghana, the former Ivory Gold Coast, uh, good uh, um, schools, and there were many people that wanted to invest. Uh, Krumah had an enormously important product. He wanted uh, to build a huge hydroelectric dam on the Volta River and to produce enough electricity to build an aluminium foundry, and this would go from the founding of the mining of bauxite right to aluminium production. And also uh, recently discovered mines would be exploited. There would be railways and a new caustic uh, soda factory. And again, the lake created with the dam would have created a river that would link the north and south of the country. Uh, the lake would then uh, produce uh, fisheries and also uh, the amount of water which would help in irrigation and uh, farming would have compensated for uh, the amount of land which was inundated. Now, this was, uh, in fact, the ideas, uh, but in fact, in April 1982, a Ghanan uh, uh, student of the University of Pittsburgh showed that nothing of this had come away, come about. In fact, the, uh, uh, di the dam had been uh, built, and therefore, in fact, we had the uh, lake of uh, Volta. Uh, there was an electric... Uh, power plant and an, al an aluminium foundry, but uh, there was no bauxite mine and no caustic soda um, factory either, and people were getting sick from 
the waters of the lake. And the people were as poor in the 1980s as they were in the late 1950s. What happened in Ghana happened in many other places as well. In the last uh, 60 years, up to 2007, the amount of aid was enormous, $2,700 billion. That's uh, 14 times the GDP of the whole of sub-Saharan Africa, if you uh, exclude the Maghreb countries. Much of this aid was development aid. Now, why did things not work? Why did what happened in Ghana happen in so many other places as well? Now, I'll spare you a whole set of details, but by and large, what happened was that the aid did not become investments and therefore development factors. Because imagine a country which uh, uh, needs uh, uh, 50 million dollars and wants to develop uh, schools, for example, and they say, okay, I've got these uh, 50 million dollars, I can make schools, but uh, I won't make uh, uh, schools of this uh, 50 million dollars, I'll use it for something else. But, and that means that the country hasn't grown. So there has been a redeployment, there was a redeployment of uh, the aid given and this generated no development and other things as well because if this was the attitude and the part of the recipients well uh, simply there was a redistribution system which uh, took place I mean okay if you like uh, the original plan to develop a school might well have been put in practice but very badly but uh, with the resources given, I create a system of redistribution of uh, wealth. I don't direct what I've been given to development. And unfortunately, this is what happened in many, many instances. Despite this, uh, the dominant position today is, no, we have to continue giving aid, doing the same thing again. And we are beginning to say no. Kofi Annan, for example, said that uh, aid is decisive and that aid indeed should be doubled and as easily had said has said today we have the greatest anti-poverty movement in history and their slogan is make poverty history this is the dominant position still today despite this uh, these and uh, Nkrumah's great integrated plans are a result of this uh, and uh, the institutional, economic, social, and political components have to be simultaneously considered all together to be considered a bona fide development plan. The World Bank analysts uh, have uh, reported that the various elements that have to be considered at the same time for uh, the famous Millennium Development Goals to be achieved are some 449. 449 elements or conditions that have to be taken into account. If each of these have the probability of uh, being successful of 99%, uh, well, that's one thing, but all, all told, the probability of success of the whole plan is uh, less than one because, of course, there's a knock-on effect if you have failure of uh, upstream it all follows downstream and therefore the whole plan will is very likely to fail now i'm not the only person to say this in 1952 the uh, most important african expert uh, herbert frankel talked uh, about uh, development uh, as being seen as an architectural issue to be uh, developed by architects but it's not that he said it's a gradual change of people and individuals using objectives which emerge slowly and things that uh, go gradually. In other words, the uh, favelas, in other words, have to be, has to be wiped out in the hearts of the people who come out of the uh, fa favelas. So we want to overturn the dominant uh, paradigm. We want to say that the dominant paradigm must become something different. Now, 
we are not saying that the uh, great institutions uh, are uh, doing uh, great things and so on, and we just clear up the mess and the uh, corners. We are saying that we want to become uh, and be at the heart of the problem and in the action taken. This is what we claim to assert as what we should do. Certainly, large-scale policies are necessary, just like you have to, when you have to have a family to uh, help a child to grow up. But uh, the point is that you have to have the child in the first place. You have to have a, an actor or somebody who is the center of attention. Now, how can this come about? Uh, let me try to be very succinct in what I'm going to say now. For the phenomenon of what we know as uh, development to, to take place, you have to have, as was said before, an encounter whereby the person uh, moves because he has uh, been um, spurred to move, because there has been that spark. At this point, I'd like to show you some slides. We have to have that encounter, as I say, in which the individual realizes that he can become a protagonist and a real actor in uh, developing uh, his own uh, self. And there has to be experience over time whereby this individual understands that he's surrounded by people that will accompany him and which are uh, involved in his development. And as Don Giussani said, uh, this is the way of fully understanding what one has before one. Otherwise, everything uh, is in doubt. Nothing is clear. In the two slides that I'm going to show you, one has to do with the experience of Klaus and Marcos, and I'd like to thank uh, Ilaria Schlitzer. These are two slides that come from her thesis. On the one hand, we have the experience of uh, uh, Salvador in San Paolo. Uh, these are experiences which are completely different. On the one hand, we have the experience of uh, uh, autonomous uh, people and their relationship uh, with uh, the institutions came later. Um, in the experience of Salvador, the experience with the in, um, institutions uh, came right from the beginning because he was involved with the uh, World Bank initiative. So here we have two opposite uh, experiences. First of all, with the institutions and uh, the other without the institutions, or the institutions only came later. We have uh, difference in places as well and location of these two experiences. Fortunately, the slides aren't coming up well. And we have, however, the same path that, uh, and the same method which was adopted by both people at the beginning had that favela in their hearts, as was said before. They can't uh, change. They say, I am what I am. So there was that initial constraint. And secondly, there was that encounter, understanding there was a possibility of change, a uh, meeting of people. And then there was uh, that great uh, road which was taken from diffidence, um, which selects out people, because some people say no, because there is a selection there. Some people uh, hold back. And then there was accompaniment, education, the experiential path. Then there were facts, things that happened have to come into my heart and be something whereby I can say, this has happened, I know this is. And then the facts. And then from this, we have a different perception which emerges. And here we have the uh, realization of one's own possibilities. So we have the encounter, the understanding, 
and then the doing. So this is the method, encounter, accompaniment, educational experience, facts that happen which allow people to change the way in which they face reality, in which they take on reality. This is the way that things happened, and this is uh, testified uh, to by the different situations in which this very same path has been taken. Now, very quickly, I'd like to give you a couple of uh, testimonies. Perhaps I'll just give you the titles. And so the point of departure is not just understanding uh, the requirements, the needs, because the list would be infinite, because you solve that one person's uh, need, you have another and then another. You start with an encounter. And some of these uh, testimonies uh, come from the experience in Salvador. Paola Ciccadini uh, collected these. I see her in the room. And uh, these testimonies show that people are aware that uh, the needs completely cannot be uh, satisfied, but one has to be there. There has to be the meeting especially. And then secondly is an encounter that changes. These testimonies are really touching. Uh, one I'd like to uh, read, and it says, everything happened, everything, everything, because uh, when you're in a constraint like that of the past, you have no horizons, you have no future. What you your maximum ambition is to become a policeman, to be able to take revenge on what's happened to you, to lay into people. And therefore, starting with an encounter, you understand the opportunity of learning something else, and a whole new world opens up to you. And it, that is when you start to identify with something. You identify with something. Because when you take this step forward, you uh, step away from something, and the favela is no longer in your heart. From that situation, you meet another. You start uh, from that new situation to believe in yourself. You begin to say, look, I can do this. I can make out. I can make it. This is, in fact, exactly the same thing that Cletus and Marcos have told us. And also the people who are there to change, change. The people who offer their help also change. And this too is very touching. There was a um, t teacher who said to me, I'm thinking of making an adoption, adopting a child. And when somebody says that, that means that one is beginning to be patient because before, she said, I was not patient. I resolved everything by reacting. And now I realize I'm learning to dialogue. I'm learning to be patient. And what has happened is an encounter, a meeting. And at the beginning of last year, in fact, she said to me, the children are beginning to grow in affect. This was something said to me by somebody who would never have used that sort of word before. This is the what has taken place. This is the growth that has taken place, uh, which has come out of that encounter, the spark which has triggered something. Uh, so the first thing is we have to change menta mentality. There's a challenge. I mean, are we right or um, are, are those right who say that uh, we have to have uh, wider policies? Some years ago, in fact, um, a colleague of mine who knew that I collaborated with AVSI said to me, well, I was very struck by by this, in fact. But what he said was, you know, what use is all your work? In a couple of years, for example, you help the 10,000 people to get out of the uh, poverty threshold, but uh, then you have an economic crisis and you have six million people that fall back into uh, poverty. That was the sort of challenge he laid down at my door. And I answered and I said, well, if you set people on that path, if you have that encounter, people, even if they have a setback, um, they have a first moment of confusion, they will uh, nonetheless uh, pick up uh, themselves and go on. Otherwise, they just remain closed clams and shells which are thrown up on uh, the shore. The favelas remains in their heart. 
So uh, development is not, in fact, uh, just a question of uh, superficial work. It's the original uh, work that we have to do and through an encounter which is very deep-rooted. And therefore, that leads us to a different way of uh, carrying out cooperation. And uh, it's through the way that we have mentioned that cooperation can become really effective. Today, the whole world of the whole world of uh, de cooperation for development has to take this on board and uh, think again. The whole uh, question of uh, how development should be rolled out is still something which uh, has to be taken on board. And. I think that this is a key pace, a key step. The um, Pope mentioned this in his salute to the G8 meeting. He said uh, development aid has to bear in mind uh, the uh, widespread activity that the Catholic Church and other confessions uh, carried out in their accompaniment of the development plans. The experience of Zerbini, Cleusa, and Marcos is here, in fact. Their starting point was abandoning the idea that somebody else with plans and programs would, in fact, respond to the needs they saw. And they got themselves moving, and by doing this, changed the lives of uh, tens of thousands of people. And also, there is a second challenge that we have uh, what keeps uh, this position going and alive? They mentioned and described the encounter that they had, uh, the name that they gave uh, to this encounter, to uh, what allowed them, despite uh, the toil, and Close said she wanted to give everything, else, everything up, they understood with this encounter why they uh, should continue. We have to give that a name. We have to uh, say why this uh, development should be made in this way and should remain in time. Can we give a name to this? This is the second issue that I uh, would like to table in my conclusion. Thank you. Grazie. Grazie carissimo Beppe perché cercare di rappresentare Thank you dear Beppe. E lì e lì fa lo che Risponde dopo. Cercare di rendere let me start again. So you depicted to us a life, but in an academic way, not an easy task. It certainly, it required a lot of attention and concentration to follow the speech. But we are all called upon to understand and realize that unless we want to be uh, closed in that circle of those who have good ideals, then we have to take on this challenge. We have to accept the fact that international institutions will have to face up to reality, to especially the reality of what we are, the mysteries of mankind. So what is distinctive of being human? Caron, quoting Don Giussani, recently said that this encounter, which triggers the spark of desire, this aspiration for the good and the truth, this is the spark uh, uh, which is behind all every dynamic, and then we go and look for um, water and bread instead of building power plants and, and aluminium. We have to get down to work to improve living conditions. 
to see why we, uh, the world is dividing between those who have and those who have not, why those receive a better treatment than others. And what is behind all of this is this tension that we all have inside of us, which is our heart. And this is a message that we have clearly sent out also to the G8 of Ministers for Development. This is indeed the greatest challenge ahead of us. And this is possible because uh, we, because there are all of you and because there's been a father who generated all of you, these people who will give strength to our hands. Thanks.